and I'm not disrespecting anybody's religion. Please forgive me if it comes off like that. I'm just stating my opinion. Can we just talk? Can we just talk? Tuned into Candid Conversation with John Davis Perry II. I'm proud because as I look out upon this crowd, there are blacks, there are whites, there are people of different races gathering together. And we're gathering together to declare that we are a people that demand justice. Greetings. This is John Perry II, and I want to say thank you for tuning in to another broadcast of Candid Conversation. Um, listen, we've been doing this for a while, and I'm extremely excited about your locking in every single week and being a part of the conversation. I want to encourage you to do your best to begin to communicate with me. Um, you can do so by going on to Facebook, and on Facebook, you, we have Candid Conversation. And so go on Facebook, join the page, um, give us some feedback, give us some ideas about some different topics and subjects that you would like to talk about. Now, as always, I want to encourage you to make the most of your life. I, I'm saying that again and again and again because there's so many people um, who are wasting the precious gift of life that God has given them. Remember, everything that God gives us is good. It's our responsibility to manage the good thing that God gives us so that it becomes a great thing. So God gives you every day a good day. It's your responsibility to manage that good day so that it becomes a great day. So manage your day in a way um, that makes it a great day for you. Without further ado, I have a special guest. This young man is a giant and he's very, very dear to me in many, many ways. Um, many years ago, um, we crossed paths and um, I saw his heart, saw his passion, and immediately felt drawn to him and really wanted to do anything that I could do to help him because I felt the hand of God upon upon his life. And so without any further ado, I have with us Kenneth Smith, the car doctor. <laughs> why why did you say hello to our, our guest? I'm so happy to be here with Dr. <laughs> Perry. And uh, I'm 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 so honored to be a part of the show today. Uh, I just want to say hello to the Brunswick community and surrounding areas. Um, looking forward to a great show and um, hopefully uh, some said today can touch somebody and change, help change somebody. Amen. Well, I'm absolutely certain that it's going to be a, a life changing show for somebody. Um, you are truly an anointed man of God who's persevered through all kinds of different things that has shaped you and developed you to be the man that you are. Um, and introducing you, I didn't, I didn't add minister or reverend onto your name, but that's one of the things that is a unique part of who you are. Yeah. Um, and so you're full of all kinds of wisdom. Um, and I'm certain that that's going to just spill over in our time of discussion on today. And so I'm like real, real excited about dialoguing with you. Oh, yeah. Let's let's kick this off by just um, simply um, talking about where you're from. Where where were you born at? I was born in Jacksonville. Uh, anybody know anything about Jacksonville? It's the north side of Jacksonville that I'm from. Um, Main Street. Um uh, Montcrief. Okay. And, and um, so I was born right there, and uh, my family originally is from the Fort Myers and um, Tallahassee area. Um, so, but I grew up and was born right there in Jacksonville and been, was there all the way up until about the age of 19. Wow. You know, you said the north side of Jacksonville, yeah. Main Street, Moncrief, and I began to smile because, you know, looking at you, um, you're this laid back, reserved um, gentleman um, who's who's well um, articulate. You, you communicate, you hold yourself together as a businessman. And for those of us who were raised in Jacksonville, <laughs> uh, when you say Main Street, <laughs> from a certain era and you and you say Moncrief from a certain era, you already know that you're talking you're talking hood, you're talking oh, yeah. thug. Oh yeah. Um I think we have that in common. I was raised in Jacksonville, a little older than you, but my mom raised me on on two two seven. <laughs> um, West Pearl Street. West Pearl, Pearl World, Pearl <laughs> yeah. World, Pearl Street. So um, I I know what it's like to be down there near uh, Main Street. 
Yeah. And then eventually, um, you know, of course, she moved over by Rebalt. And, yeah, yeah, you know, Rebalt. of course, you know, you have some, you have houses over there, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my dad was from Shellwood. Yeah. So we was, we was true. Well, my dad went to same school. You went to Rebalt and, uh, all uh, my family kind of went the uh, reins, so you know how that for you. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, Lord. I, I used to get in fights with Sherwood people all the time. <laughs> um, and then when I I got old enough to move out, I moved into my Creek Villas. Oh man! Uh, so you know, you know, I understand that whole world yes. that you're talking about, and it's amazing to me that coming from that kind of element. Um, that God was able to take someone like me, someone like you, and and raise us out of that element and still preserve our mind, preserve our integrity. And what people see on the outside is way different from the experience that we went through coming up in those areas. Yeah, man. Uh, as you know, very well know, some of us didn't make it a good majority of the same people we hung around yeah. and ran with did not make it. And the only difference between a lot of, between the ones that didn't make it and the ones that did is a decision. Yeah. Is a decision. Um, wow. You know, I don't think I'm better than nobody else cause I made it this far. Uh, I got so many friends that's dead or either in jail. Um, and it's just that they went left with the, crowd and I went right, right at certain times. Um, when you got, I got, I had God in me a long time. You know, I think I got first had the first encounter with God at 13 is when I first was slain in the spirit. Right. And I just got up different. Everything about me didn't change. Right. But I tell you what, I don't know if he was hiding behind my kidney, but he was somewhere <laughs> in me <laughs> and he kept me and I, I had enough wisdom to know when trouble was either approaching or when I was going to end up in it. So I had a thing where I could hang with bad people, but when the trouble come, they Deserve look around it. and I'm gone. Deserve you know, it. Spiritual yeah. discernment. So, um, like I said, it was just a, de it's a decision. It's not about being that, that I was so much better. Or God loved me more. Mm. It's just that I listened to him more. Right. I, I made the right decision when it mattered. Man, when you talk about the decision part, it caused an explosion of thought to, to just open up in my mind because I said to you that I used to fight with people in Sherwood, and that's no underestimated. No, no, that's not under, uh, that's not an understatement. From ninth grade to my senior year, it was full of back and forth jumping on one another. Really? Jumping on one another, jumping on one another. I mean, group fights um, or the, a group trying to catch me by myself and trying to jump me. Yeah. It's, it yeah. just kept going on yeah. for a period of four years. Mm -hmm. And the last incident, um, I'm walking home from school and they, a group of five guys run to catch me on that, that viaduct that goes uh -huh, across the road. Yep. They caught me on the bridge. One guy run, ran in front of me and he said, Poop, poop, poop. You thought that it was over. Yeah. And and I, I looked out the corner of my eye and could see guys behind me. Uh -huh. Drop my briefcase, man, and started running. Yeah. Uh, eventually they caught me um, once I got off of the bridge. And, you know, of course, you know, you go through the little getting jumped by Jump, guys yeah. for about, about a minute, minute and a half. Yeah. And um, they say, we got him. And yeah. as soon as they turned their back, man, I jumped up like a little rat. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but but um, after all of that happened that day, my mom gets home. She takes me to find the ringleader. Yeah, I've just got jumped. She takes me to find knots on my head, bruised. Mm. She takes me to find the ri ringleader, and she gets out of her car with a gun in her hand. Ooh. And she says, if you want to fight him, you're going to fight him one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> now, I just got jumped. <laughs> So I'm, I'm sitting there fighting Thor blows with this guy, trying to do my best. And frankly, he gets the best of me in that moment. Uh -huh. And I leave the moment, get in the car, and, you know, listening to my mom, you know, and all mm -hmm. of this different stuff. Man. And part of me is saying, okay, when are you going to get him back? Yeah. 
But then that, that thing that you talked about, God hiding behind your kidney, yeah. <laughs> um, began to speak. And something said to me, either you're going to let this go now mm. or it's going to end up much worse. That's right. Either you're going to have to kill somebody or you're going to wind up in jail or somebody's going to sur- 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 seriously hurt you. So you got to make a decision. Decision. Right. right now. And that was a very, very critical point of decision for me because I was still young, oh, yeah. still full of ego. Yeah. Um, didn't, didn't, didn't want my ego to, you know, to take a bad rep, mm-hmm. but there was something greater on the inside of me, um, compelling me and telling me, you got to make a decision right now to change the course of this. And if I wouldn't have listened to that, wow, I don't think I would be here talking to you right now. Wow. It's amazing. My brother got jumped on that same bridge. That's how I, that's how I, know, that's how I know he left Reigns and went to Reebok. And I'm telling the story if you're watching me online. But he left Reigns and went to Reebok, and they didn't welcome him too well. <laughs> <laughs> Following a girl, and they didn't welcome him too well. So I know about that bridge there. Yeah. And you yes. right down in Jacksonville, I tell you, they'll jump you over and over again when you're yeah. in high school. So. Went through that. <laughs> yeah, man, those feuds and, and rivals. And I guess back in the 80s, um, 80s I, I graduated in the 90s, mm-hmm. 91. But in the 80s, it started. Then we bridged over to the 90, 90s and yeah. we, we kept that mentality of jumping on one another and things. So um, you mentioning this whole thing of, of the power of decision. is real important. And I, I really want to emphasize that right now because I think there's somebody listening to who doesn't really define it as a defining moment. God's wrestling with their heart about some decisions, really trying to to tell them to go a certain way, and they're still fighting with the voice that they hear. But from 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 me and Minister Smith, you can you can best believe it that in those moments where your heart is convicting you about trying to take an alternative um, direction, it's God trying to to divinely touch you on the place of decision so that he can preserve you. That's right. Um, and he can, he can bring about whatever healthy manifestation that he wants to bring, bring about in your life. So, so how, how long were you in Jacksonville before moving here? Um, well, I was in Jacksonville from, from birth up to the age of 16. At 16, I first found out that Brunswick exists because um, I, I guess we'll get into it later. I was standing in a park, and uh, my grandmother and my, one of my aunts came and told me about signing up for Job Corps. Hmm, okay. So um, I came here for Job Corps and stayed to the age of 17 here at the Brunswick Job Corps Center. Wow. And that's why I learned intelligence. Yeah. Uh, that's why I learned social skills. Hmm. That's why I learned how to get along well with others. And I met a preacher there that went on and helped water the seed that was planted at 13 years old. And I first started, um, I changed the kind of people I was hanging around and started hanging with ministers and preachers and older people and people that, it was two young men in Job Corps. Um, they was way older. I think it was like 20. And um, I was 16 at the time. And they dressed so well, man. They yeah. The first time I had seen men with darker um Pants and and they taught me about the that's that's the shoes yeah and polo collar shirts and <laughs> stuff and I, I I had never had that so I tried dressing up one day in some of their clothes and I felt good yeah and I just said you know what this is how I want to dress from now on so they taught me how to make my belt match my shoes yeah you know and and stuff of that nature about how. The heel of how the um, hem of your dress pants supposed to wow. fall on your shoes and stuff of that nature. So they taught me stuff that my dad was never there to teach me. I don't, don't even know if he knew, right. you know. So um, that's how I found out about Brunswick. So I went back to Jacksonville, and at the age of 19, um, I moved back here. I, relo- I reconnected with that preacher from Job Corps okay. out of the blue. And during that time, it was a very... Rough time. I was staying with my dad over in um, Secret Village, which okay. you probably know where that's at. That's yeah. not next door to Washington Heights. And um, we was running. A, he was my dad was running a drug house, mm-hmm. like a big drug house. So um, 
the young man asked me if I wanted to move down here to change. And he told me he was getting married the next day and to wow. a girl out of Darien. And I moved just out of faith. I had 35 cents in my pocket <laughs> and a bus ticket. And I moved. And, and that's how I wound up here. Wow. That's that's powerful all by itself. We could we could spend an hour talking about that. Yeah, I'm I'm so glad to hear that Job Corps had that kind of positive impact. Not mm-hmm. just the not just the the workers, not just the faculty, right? But you also had students that were positive influence because Job Corps is still actively a part of our community. Oh yeah, I'm still extending those type of opportunities and. I think there's so many people who don't understand the power and the necessity of our local job corps, and it should get so much more support than it, yeah, gets. Than it gets. Yeah, Thank God for the people who are um, lobbying, lobbying around it and working with it. Um, but this is a very, very, an, a very, very intentional shout out that we need to do our part as a community to make sure that our local job corps has everything that it needs because. It is making a positive impact oh, yeah. upon people's lives. Yeah. And Minister Smith is is just one yeah. of the, the great stories that comes out of our local job corps. That's right. Um, and so I'm glad that you, you, you mentioned that. Also, this whole thing of the opportunity that you received when, when the minister said to you, hey, do you want to? It's, yeah. it's, it's, it, I tell people all the time, it starts with the, the desire of your heart. You know, what's your personal intent? Because if the intent of your heart is right, opportunity has a way of, of revealing itself. Yeah. It may not be easy, yeah. but that opportunity will emerge and reveal itself. Right. And so you had a desire for better despite what you were in. The opportunity comes through invitation um, from the minister at that time that you have a relationship with. Mm-hmm. And he tells you, you know, do you want to move? But then it requires faith on your part to say, listen, this is the, my desire. That's right. He's extending the opportunity. Let me allow faith to be the bridge that gets me across. Because yeah. I, I don't clearly see everything. That's right. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have this thing all mapped out. But I'm going to let my faith be the bridge that takes me over into this ram of new opportunity. Right. Right. And it's important that people understand that the process of transformation isn't always easy. <laughs> yeah. And that's amazing. Uh, you know, I was just thinking that, but I'm going to tell you, uh, <sighs> and, and I guess we can get into this now about um, my childhood growing, growing up to the age of 16. Yeah. You know, I think everything that I'm living now, everything that I've, encountered from the time I've been here to now has been easy part for somebody else, but easy for me Mm. because of from where the boot camp God took me through to get me to where I'm at now. So my boot camp was basically uh, growing up in Jacksonville homeless the whole time. I mean, living in cars, living on my family members porch uh, with my mom and my brothers and, um, just being literally homeless, you know, it's, uh, my mom never had a house ever, mm. ever. We always lived with strange men or even people cars or that they might've had broke down in the backyard or on people porch. Right. So we walked to school and all our clothes was in a wind Dixie bag. You know, all of us might've had our own wind Dixie bag with our little clothes in it. That was it. And, um, it was like that all the way up, man. I dropped out of school in the eighth grade. So when my grandmother came to the park to ask me about going to job corps, I was 16 in the eighth grade and had failed again. Wow. It's hard to go to school when you don't have clean clothes. Mm-hmm. You're going to get picked at every day. Your shoes smell awful. Um, you don't have a haircut. You ain't, you're not brushing your teeth. You're not taking a bath. Right. You know, um, so, uh I can remember going a month without taking a bath. Mm. You know, I can, um, I mean, taking a bath was one of the last things kind of on your mind when you got to figure out how you're going to eat. Right. Uh, if you're safe or you're sleeping at that night. Um, you know, I went through, went through a whole lot. Uh, so the times that I would go and stay with some of my family, you'll get treated really bad. Mm. Um, they might treat you good for the first couple of days or so, but then you treat it bad. You talk, have to hear him talk about your mom and how bad she on drugs and how much she running from her responsibility. So then you feel like you're a burden 
on them. And I've had a couple of them that would, wouldn't let you take a bath in their house mm. or would come and take the light bulb out the room so you can't use any power, can't use the toilet. You have to go to the gas station. That drew me to living in a park. I said, if I'm going to live like this, I am. And I mean, I might as well just stay in the park. At least I'm not a burden on them, you know. So I just started staying in the park. And I wind up off and on being in that park for about three whole years during the winter. You know, I ate fruit off the tree at certain times of the year. It was a church around the corner. It was a church around the corner from the park that an old lady uh, went to uh, named Mother Albright. And I would go there on Wednesday nights. Uh, so, you know, at, like I said, when at 13, when God slayed me in the spirit, it was something that I just liked at church, you know. But um, so I, I found that little church and I just went to going just to have somewhere to be. You know, it was around the corner from the park and every Wednesday I'll go and she'll give me two dollars. Now, I liked it the two dollars, too. Now, <laughs> so she'll give me two dollars. So I bought a pack of cookies, uh, a couple of packs of cookies and ate it with the two rolls in them. And I eat a roll a day to help me survive. And sometimes my grandmother, um, I can go by there and get something to eat. So I lived in that park in a baseball field in a dugout. And it's not one of the dugouts that's in the ground. It's just so uh, this park is on Norwood Avenue, hmm. uh, right down from uh, Gateway Mall. So it had the dugout was kind of like a fence and a bench in it. So I just kind of hung around in there. And the mentality I had is I always wanted to have something. So I took a rock, and I can remember on the little ground, which was concrete, I wrote squares and wrote living room, kitchen, and mm-hmm. stuff like that down there. And I can remember God telling me it wasn't going to be like that always. But I couldn't see it. Right. I could not see it. If you, I wanted stuff, but I, it was so far out my reach. I had so many stumbling blocks in my way. It was To me, it was just no way it was going to happen. And my mom, she was just at the time running around on drugs really, really bad. She wasn't no cute crackhead, okay? Right. <laughs> she was the kind that wore the skull cap and long jacket in the summertime. Right. I mean, just, and prostituting, we, we saw her sleep with a lot of men. Some men we had to run behind to get the money after she got through because they would try to run. Mm-hmm. Um... So we went through a lot, you know, yeah. a whole lot. So the stuff that I went through then helped me with budgeting now, mm. taught me how to go without stuff that I don't need, mm. taught me how to uh, um, basically appreciate the smaller things in life. Yeah. You know, and I've learned, uh, uh, Pastor Perry, that in appreciating smaller stuff, God give the increase with the bigger stuff. Yeah. If you don't worry about the bigger stuff, if you don't let it be your main focus, you know, God add the increase to all that stuff. Yeah. You know, so I, that's how I have been as successful as I have right now is because I don't worry about the bigger stuff in life. You know, when it comes to materialistic stuff, everything I have, everything God have done it's for me genuinely worrying about somebody else first or putting somebody else first. And then God always, some kind of way, press down, shaking together and run my cup over. Hey, Amen. That's, that's powerful. There's so many nuggets in that. And I, I really pray that it's blessing those of you that are listening, listening right now. Because a lot of times people see you in the present and have no idea just how hard your past has been, mm. um, that your process wasn't one that it was void of pain, um, of, of trial and tribulation, and your ability to just honestly, wholeheartedly communicate it without reservation is refreshing. Because I think a lot of times people go through things and they're ashamed of what they, they've gone through, and so they, they can't talk or share freely. And when they're not able to talk and share freely, so many people get robbed of the lessons of their journey. And so um, it's, it's powerful to hear you talk about the different things that took place. And so in your estimation, you see your experience that you went through as, as a strength at this stage of your life. You know, um, I have to make it a strength. Okay. I fight with it. 
Yeah. To be honest. I could be sit up here and say that I'm a man, I'm hard, I'm yes, yes, sir. I'm King Kong. No. I fight with it. Yeah. It's a strength during the day. Yeah. It's a fear at night. Hmm. Hmm. That's it's, a powerful. It's a strength during the day for me. But when I lay down and it's just me laying there and uh, there's nobody to smile for anymore. Yeah. Because um, when you're a figure in the community, um, if you see somebody in Walmart, you have to smile because they expect you to smile. Uh, in my business, I have to smile. Somebody come up to me about a book, I have to smile. Yeah. Um, but when I lay down at night, then um, I'm just Kenny. I'm just, uh, I can see it all. Like, yeah. I can feel it all. I could, I'm in fear of going back to what, what happens if you lose everything mm. and you wind up right back there. It's a fear. Uh, so, and then it, it, some of the stuff that I experienced growing up made me not trust women. Okay. You know, I've been married twice. Um, one thing I've always said, even in, in going through a divorce one and divorce two, I always have said, what could I have done better? Right. Myself. It's easy to point a finger at somebody else, but what in it that I could have done better? And when I research my life, I think about, you know what? You didn't trust from the beginning. Hmm. You didn't trust from the beginning. Your, your mother um, started the foundation of like a trust in your life from not being there and taking care of you. Um, your aunties closed doors in your face and wouldn't allow you to use restrooms, took light bulbs out the room, talked about you, called you all kind of names. All your hurt came from women. Um, but, you know, I had to tell myself that I'm not my hurt. That's good. You know, that I'm not, I'm not my DNA. Uh, I'm not my mother. I'm not my father. I'm, I'm better than them in that area. So I... Um, I quickly at night have to snap out of it sometime. You know, I share this with you and, and hopefully it helps somebody. Um, this is something that I'm getting y'all that's not in my book. So y'all get something that I couldn't put in my book. Um, I seen so much hurt. I seen my mother. Um, I seen my mother go through a miscarriage where the baby came out and it was uh, stillborn in the toilet at a drug house. And with her, she had me and my brother at that time was about 11 years old. Uh, it was about one in the morning at a drug house and she had us to go and throw the baby in the dumpster, which the baby was already dead, let me say that. Um, but it was not the right process of what's supposed to happen. Right. So with that being said, we left that house the next morning and walked away like nothing happened. Mm. Like nothing happened. That happened at 11 years old. Yeah. Um, I spent the rest of, still to today, I have bad dreams of falling down stairs. And when I get to the bottom, I see my little sister at the bottom, mm. just as she was. So um, I had problems trusting. Right. You know, so... That's why I have to put all my trust in the Lord. Yeah. Because people will fail you, but you have to trust. I had to learn how to trust the God in people. Mm. So I try to connect myself to godly people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, hearing you talk about your experience is real interesting because on one end, at a very vulnerable stage of your life when you needed family, family really wasn't there. And you pulled away, learned how to to just fend for yourself. So right. you you learned to be in isolation um, because the model was I can't depend upon them. Um, and even if I wanted to, they see me as a burden. So I have to um, pull away and just take care of myself. Right. But when you ran into the the woman at the church yeah. that would give you the two dollars and, and you just like being there, even though you're family experience spoke one thing to you. The church kept on emerging 
that th there can be family, there, there can be community and connection. Um, and so it seems like, you know, at some point you, you're, you're, you're on the seesaw of, yeah. okay, what is the real truth here? Because right. I don't get it with my family, but I have these little spurts of getting it with the church community. And you share this, this, this wonderful concept that in public, some days I'm one person. Yeah. But then when I go home and I'm all by myself, there's something totally different. Right. Um, there's, this, there's still the wrestle with my yesterday yeah. in my private, private moments. And I think there are a lot of people who don't have the strength to acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, so hearing you say it, I believe it's bringing comfort to some people's heart because okay. there's, there's that us, that the conscious us that navigates through the day. We know what we need to do to successfully navigate our relationships, to get um, our performance tasks done throughout the course of the day. Mm -hmm. But then when all of that is gone away, you're left with self. That's right. And you're, you've got to ask those questions. Am I really happy? <sighs> you know, you got to ask those questions. Am I Am I really living the life that I'm supposed to live? You got to ask that question. You know, what if I lose all of this, you know, that, that I'm working for right now? Then what? Yeah. And in those moments when you're wrestling with all of those, those fears in your words, how, how do you manage that process, the, the late night process of just thoughts? Now, you did say sometimes you just have to shut it down, but... When you don't consciously shed it down, what are some of the 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 tools that you use to navigate through those thoughts? Okay, um, it's a couple of things. Uh, one thing is, I my my mom had been on drugs for thirty years. Mm. Even after I moved up here, she continued on drugs. Right, um, I would put her in a drug rehab, she would just walk away before I hit the Georgia line. Wow. So I would go down there and pay debts for from drug addicts that hit her in the mouth, knock my teeth down, all kind of stuff. So I said that to let you know how hard, how deep she was in. And over a period of 30 years, I think she stayed up here with me about nine times and just would leave. So I said it to say now today, she's been clean for seven years. Wow. Wow. First time she's had her own place. To God be the glory. And that's what I have to think on hmm. now is that if she did it, if she overcame that through a, without a rehab. Wow. Without a rehab. Hmm. If she overcame that, then God got this, you know, and, and, and this is just me uh, going through some of my past thoughts and past hurts and past. And I'm thinking like, Kenny, if your mom can stay off drugs after going through all she been through, all the different men, all the different spirits yeah. that she fights with, all the different spirits she took on, all the different drugs, mm. you was just with her. You wasn't doing it. Yeah. But she was actually putting the can to her mouth, putting the pipe to her mouth. So she can sleep at night. You got to shake this because, uh, you know, I look at her as, even though some people feel like I shouldn't, I've, I've got that before. I, I look at her as a hero in my eyes yeah. because I seen what the fight was like. Yeah. So most time I think on my mom, I think on my mom Yeah. and how much she need me to stay positive, how much she need me to stay strong because now she go to church with me. She beat me to church, <laughs> calling me by church. Uh, and I say, he used me to help pull her to where she's at. And I always knew, though, uh, Pastor Perry, I always knew. I say, I, when I was in church and, and speaking like a madman, I was, I, and man, I'm telling you, uh, praying for people with cancer and all this stuff and people being delivered and healed. And I'm like, I don't understand it. My mom is 
But sometimes my mom would come and sit outside of the church on the church steps and would not come in. I don't know. She out there until late on after service. And um, it made the next Sunday made me say, how is it that you ain't here doing all this for all these people? And your mom's still out there. Mm. And you used her to have a giant in the Lord like myself. Yeah. Not boasting, but, and, but, but. I know you got to do something with her because she was able to carry me. Right. And you operate through me greatly. Yeah. So you got to do something with her. So when I think of all that, it helps me to get through my night. Wow. You you said something that made me want to shout up in here if we was in the full walls of a church. <laughs> I'd have told the organist, play, play the music. Give me some <laughs> shout music. When you stated that when I'm wrestling with those things, I think about my mom because for me, she's hero. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you talked about how there's some people that challenge that, yeah. but, but you see her as hero. Yeah. And it, it reminds me of one of our late great spirits that has gone, gone to be with the Lord. Um, Tupac Shakur. Sure. Yeah. Tupac, you yeah. know, he yeah. still saw his mom as a hero. I didn't know that. Yeah. He, she, she, she got strung out on drugs, oh, yeah. on crack and he said, you'll always be my hero. Wow. And when he talked about it in, in an extensive way in interviews, he would say that I understand the pain of what she went through. Yeah. And because of the pain, she was trying to find a way to escape that pain. And I can relate. Yeah. And most people who wouldn't be able to embrace your concept of your mom being hero, they don't have a good theology of pain. Pain. When it's internalized deep, man, you find every way possible of escaping the pain. I had a member one time who was complaining to me about her father. Her father had cancer. And she said, I'm trying to get him to stop taking this medicine because every time he takes the medicine, all he does is sleep. And I said, well, why is he taking, why is he taking the medicine? Um, because, you know, he, he, has, he has cancer. I said, how far is he into it? He was far off in the stages. Uh -huh. And I said, well, I said, no offense, but why would you want him to experience that degree of pain? Yeah. Just so that you can have him up and conscious at another level for you. Right. And I said, you know, it's the human nature to want to escape pain. And a lot of people who are on the streets who are um, doing drugs and all kinds of things, there's some form of pain and trauma that they're trying to find a way to just numb. Yeah. Um, but despite the fact um, that she went through that, I'm glad that you were able to see that there's still value to her life. Oh, yeah. And in many ways, she's still a hero um, despite the picture. Cause our modern day, a picture of a hero. If you're a hero, you got to be without flaw. Yeah. You got to be perfect yeah. <laughs> in order to be a hero. But in your definition is sobering because it means that I don't have to have a spotless record to be a hero. And you're a preacher. So you, 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 you know very well this lineage that I'm about to give. Moses is able to say, you know, I murdered a man and tried to hide it up. Yeah. Um, and yet God used me to be a hero. <laughs> you know, King David. Yeah. You know, he has these different moments that reveal that he's still fragile after God then claimed him as a man after his own heart. Right. And yet God still uses him as a hero, despite all of the failures and flaws that he went through. That's right. Um, and so the idea of hero is not that you have to be perfect in some unique way. You tap into your purpose and you do the good despite yourself. That's right. That God gives you a platform to 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 do or reveal to the world. And your mom did a wonderful job in bringing you in the world. Yeah. Um, you you are having impact upon lives. I've been mean, talking with you the other day. You were sharing with me um, how you have this this passion for um, a few things. I know our initial conversation, you had a passion to share with young men your story and, you know, um, it, it's manifest in the book. And I think you share more than with just young men. Now you yeah. just share with abroad, people yeah. abroad. But you also talked about the passion that has emerged in your heart about violence that is taking place within our communities. Yeah. 
And so I want to talk a little bit about your, your, your passion. We know a little bit about the person. We know um, about different aspects of your personal process and pain. Now we want to hear about, you know, the passion that drives you in this season. Well, man, uh, being here in Brunswick, I've been here now about 22 years. Um, didn't even think I'd make it three months, okay? <laughs> but been here about 22 years. Brunswick has been great to me, man. Yeah. Uh, I, I originally moved to Derry in Georgia under the great pastor, uh, Griffin Lotson, All which right. is my godfather over there. You hear Central that name Oregon. everywhere. Yeah. So he's some god. And, I, and he do a lot of community work over in Derry, and everybody know him. Um, and I just got a chance to travel with him doing so much. And uh, being here in Brunswick now, which I've been for, gosh, last 17 years, I, uh, uh, I've i seen the city go from one thing to another. Right. When I first moved here, it was a place that people would love to come to and go travel and visit St. Simon, visit Jacob Island. Um, even some of the downtown Brunswick area was a nice area with the nice um, antique houses down there and stuff was a nice area. Um, over a period of years, uh, we've seen it change. Right. We've seen violence go up. We've seen gangs come from Miami and the surrounding areas. We've seen gangs form right here at our own local uh, bite yards with some of our own children. Right. Me being a master life coach and, 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 and working with teenagers, mostly young boys, I got boys all the way from the age of four years old that's right here claiming gangs right here in our city. Wow. Um, I find that there's a glitch in our, our justice system here in the city of Brunswick. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're putting bandages on a lot of the problems that's going on here in the city and then want to know why they're happening again. Uh, in Jacksonville growing up, we had, a uh, um, it was an organization called Mad Dad. So I right. think they're still around. I see them on the news here and there. Uh, when trouble and crime take place, the community of, uh, of and it's supposed to be a community of fathers that came together um, that I guess their kids was in crimes or was killed or murder and wanted change in the community. We, uh, I don't see a lot of that right here. Right. Um, uh, I know we got the NWACP, which... Um, you, uh, I think, heads this uh, district. We have uh, NWACP, but it takes a village to really bring about a change the way that the change is supposed to come. I can't tell you how many parents I have called me about their teenage children. They say, I just don't know what to do with him. He's in a gang. He's smoking weed. He's hitting me. Wow. He's fighting me. And he, there's no man in the house. And I don't know what to do. I'm about to pull my hair out. I done tried everything. You know, the problem that we have is we need uh, some more organizations here in this city, some another plan to whereby we can work with the young people and the young men. Right. Because the truth, the truth about it, uh, the truth about it is our police department can't raise the teenagers. Right. The, the, the pastor can't raise your teenager. The school teacher can't raise your teenager. First, we got, I think we got to uh, start doing our part a little more as the parents in the house. Right. You know, and, and tighten up a little more there. And let's try to team up with the different agencies to help combat the gang activity that's going on here in the city. And that's the biggest thing that got that got me is the gang activity. Um, just me myself was in was in a house that got shot up maybe two or three weeks ago. Wow. Um, so I made it out of that alive, and everybody that was in the house made it out of alive. And these were young kids mm. that were shooting guns that they couldn't even control. Thank God, their guns were so big and so powerful, to wow. they couldn't even shoot the house up right. But wow. uh, so I said that to say. We are all a small community here in Brunswick. If your child do something to me or whatnot, we should be able to team up and see what's going on with that child, get the child a help it need or whatever, you know, and um, work as a community, not being at each other's throat when I literally know that my child or your child was wrong for doing what they did. Right. 
Yeah. You 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 threw out a a, a tall order there. I, I definitely share your your sentiments in in regards to we definitely need to come together and rally around our young people and give them the support and the help that they need. Um, I know I was talking with you the uh, a few days ago and I shared with you that the the nature of crimes are beginning to get much more violent and and bold. Yes. And one of the things that I've been sharing with people is that coming up in Jacksonville, um, we we always saw some level of crime. Right. But it intensified over the years to where literally you expect to hear about a homicide every single day now. Oh, yeah. Um, and what it taught me is that there comes a point where it, the, it catches momentum. And then those law enforcement that you have in place, they can't do they can't they can't reel it back in. Mm -hmm. So before it gets fully out of control, catches too much momentum, we have an opportunity here, as you're saying, to put our feet on the ground, get involved, do some different things to help our other organizations team up with one another so that we can try to reach these youth before it's too late. I think what you're absolutely right. What I think needs to happen, I believe that it's a great move that we did for Floyd that got killed. Um, for Aubrey, I believe that every rally, I, I've been out to him myself, uh, it's, it's great. I don't know why it's okay in some eyes when m m when a gang member or a crime take place in our own backyard with our own race. But the next day, if the police officer kills one of ours, absolutely, we gather up in thousands. Yeah. You know, but we having it happen right there in our own backyard every day and we're not gathering at all. Right. So my concept is why we can't there's strength in number. I understand it's gains. I understand that. Why we can't rally, rally together about the crime that's going on right in our own neighborhoods. You know what I'm saying? Like, because when they know that we're going to talk when they know that we're going to tell, when they know that the word snitch don't mean nothing to us, right? they go somewhere else. Yeah. When we lock our neighborhoods down yes, and we, and we see a strange car on the block that, that, that's, that's, that, you know, that we going to call and we going to be the neighborhood watch, whatever happened to neighborhood watch. Yeah. That we going to be the neighborhood watch. It lets it lets people. It lets them know that listen, this is not the neighborhood to do this in. This right. is they not having it. Yeah. But the problem is, in our a lot of our mentalities is we only get angry when another race or the police kill our children. Yeah. When the truth be told, we have no classes set up that's teaching our young black men how to respond when they are being pulled over by the police. Right. You have to know, and, and, and they're so angry for some reason, till they got so much aggression, to soon as they're pulled over, some of them, you start getting cursed. They start cursing and being disrespectful off rip. Yeah. And you know how I know? Because I'm dealing with the same kids that's being disrespectful to their own parents. Right. So if they're going to fight and be disrespectful to their own parents, they're not going to respect the police no more. Yeah. Now, not to say that there's not some bad cops out here that's just looking for somebody to kill, okay? <laughs> but the truth of it is, I want to know that my child knew how to respond when they was pulled over by the police. Yeah. So if, so just to sum it up, I my, my goal is to somehow organize some kind of rallies against violence so that we can come together as a stronger community and have each other back in our neighborhoods. Hey, that's absolutely powerful. You, you've said so much. You, you know that I'm, I'm running for mayor and hearing you say that is refreshing because there's a part of our neighborhoods and communities that we got to win back again. It's a travesty when you can walk from one block to the next block and there's this gross difference. Yes. 
you know, yes. one one block looks like World War Three. The the next block looks like you're in a, a private gated sector. Yeah. Um, and so we've got to do the work of of winning our communities back. And much of what you talked about is the answer to to winning those communities back, reestablishing them, making them healthy places. When we talked when you talked about the idea that where is the neighborhood watch that used to be a staple oh, yeah. of our communities. Yeah. I think what has happened is that there's this distrust that has built up between um, community and law enforcement in certain areas. And so we got to find a way to bridge that gap and create new health. Um, you know, one of the things that sad, saddens me that jumped up in my mind when you were talking was the, this seems like there's a numbness to the loss of life. Mm. You know, you can have this gun violence and black on black crime, crimes that happens in certain communities, um, whether it's black on black or just community um, members. And it's almost like, OK, another person died and we become so numb to the idea of people dying. And it's a sign that we have lessened the value of human life. Right. And until we begin to value human life again, we're 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 gonna have more and more and more of this. I was talking with someone and I shared with them. I'm highly concerned that people can die tragically in our city, and our city officials, whoever they may be, don't feel this this need to go to the family, yeah, and say, listen, we we're sorry that this had to happen. Like if a police officer shoots someone, uh huh. Um, the case of Charles Moses. Now, right now, the that was the young, young man, man that got shot downtown. in the back. Yeah, got shot in the back downtown. Mm -hmm. There's still different stories going around. Police officers say that he was shooting, so they had to shoot him. Mm -hmm. But can we be the kind of community that even if I wear a badge and your son was shooting at me and I had to return fire and it led to the loss of his life, can there be enough humility that you go to the family and say, listen, sincerely, I'm sorry that this, this had to take place. I value, I value the, the life of your son. And in my heart, I really wish this could turn, turn out a different way. Where, where is the, that kind of empathy nowadays, especially in an in a, in a area that's this small? You know, I, I believe that it would be the job of, of every public official in the matter of tragic deaths to, to contact the family in an area this small and say, hey. When you say that, I think about, you know, us being in church and stuff. I think about the hospitality in the church, you know. <laughs> um, that's not a bad committee to have within the city. <laughs> you know, somebody that, that does reach out. Yeah, and, and even if the person that might, the officer that might have did the killing, uh, don't feel comfortable because you know don't know if, how the parents or whatever is going to respond to them, um, but uh, should be somebody to reach out to say um, to do to do something, and that's why in this city right now it's time for change. Yeah, it's time for change from the White House to the outhouse. It's time for change. Yeah, in, in America. Uh, if we have had the electoral, the officials that's been in there already and been in there for a long time, we see what keep happening. Right. Um, it's insane to want change and don't do anything to get change. You know, we uh, it's time for change, brother. It's time for change. And it's time. I know it's a couple of people running for mayor uh, besides yourself. Right. And. I don't, you can't be the problem or been the problem in the community. And now all of a sudden you got the answer to the problem in the community. Um, and if you already been in office in the community, already is in office and have done nothing to fix the problem in the community, then why do you need another year yeah. when you've had years? Yeah. So I love everybody, but listen, truth is truth. And um, I need somebody with a vision yeah. Not a ghetto vision, <laughs> but vision yeah. right. that could take the people to the next level with standards and, and that have some type of integrity about yeah. themselves. When the mark killing took place, you would not think that this city have a black mayor 
from the way that things went. The mayor of this city should have been in the forefront, mm. in the forefront, um, making powerful statements. But we can't become so buddy buddy with people till we can't do our job. Yeah, I think on that. I think on that. There are a lot of different um, perspectives. He was at the forefront of it, and there was a group of them that agreed that I should be the spokesperson for the situation. They didn't want too many different voices that could possibly say a lot of different things. So he, he was one of the two people who called me in to a meeting at the very offset okay. and began to talk about the situation that was taking place. Okay. And, and they officially said, we're going to allow you to be the voice of this since you're over the NAACP. Okay. And that way we can filter all the um all of the communication and we have a single right. um a single message going forth okay. um now to your point uh, there are a lot of people have said that they wanted the mayor to be more vocal and they they wanted to see him say a lot more and do a lot more in in that matter and so it lets you know that the hearts of the people is is to have a, a giant in their leader and I, I clearly understand that. But I, I always try to um, make sure I add balance by saying strategically mm -hmm. he was moving mm -hmm. um, and trying to put things in place to help um, that situation. Okay. So it was happening strategically. Um, but I, I understand the point that you're making. Yeah. I also believe that, you know, our city is in need of, of great change. Yeah. That things have to, they, they got to shift. And I think that those who have been reared with the heart of Jesus Christ, I think that this is a wonderful opportunity for them to emerge. Because right now what we're getting back to is, can we have public officials and elected officials that love people? Right. And they're willing to decide in a way that does right by all people, not just certain segments of people. Mm -hmm. So if they have some righteous conviction. That conviction will cause them to operate out of a spirit of love. Man, I got to have you back again. Man, you, I enjoyed it, man. You are, you are a great, great guest. I told you all up front um, that Minister Smith is full of wisdom. And I want you to just share uh, how can we get a hold of your book. Uh, you can get my book on lulu.com, L-U-L-U.com. It's called A Kenneth Smith Story on lulu.com. Listen, I'm hoping that Tyler Perry gets a hold of this book uh, and ask you for the rights to, to, to do your story um, because you have a powerful story and no one would believe that God has brought you and that you've come through the stuff that you've come through. Yes, um, and so thanks again for sharing. And I will look forward to doing this soon with you again, my brother. Thank you, man. God. All right. Well, until next week, I pray that God keeps you and that he leads you in all that you do. Um, make sure you tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell an enemy. Tune in next week for Candid Conversation with yours truly, John Perry.